Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Lewis D. Grace. I'm the professional development officer for the National Capital Area Chapter of APA. I'm your professional development officer. And today is the last day of our 2021 conference. And this is the last session, um, the land use law update. So I wanted to thank you all for um, participating as attendees at our conference this week. I hope you guys all had a great time, got your CM credits and uh, learned a lot. I just wanted to touch on a few things before I hand it over to Jesse Richardson of West Virginia University. Um, as some of you may be aware, Starting next year in 2022, the APA is going to update the CM requirements. Um, I have a webinar with APA to get more guidance on that. And hopefully later this month, we'll send out an email with those updates, just so you guys know before next year what the changes are and what that will require of you. So keep an eye out for that. Also, probably this afternoon or uh, later this week, we'll send out an email with all of the recordings for all of the sessions, this one included, and the um, links for the, CM for the CM credits, just so you can log your uh, CM credits. And if you guys have any questions or concerns, um, thumbs ups or anything you'd like to discuss, feel free to email me. My email is aicp at ncac-apa.org. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jesse uh, Richardson, JD, West Virginia University. Um, Jesse, the floor is yours. Thank you for your time. And if anyone has any questions for Jesse, please put them in the chat and I will... Um, go over them with Jesse after he's done with his presentation. So with that, Jesse, the floor is yours. I will turn off my camera and my microphone and the show is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. And good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for uh, being here today. The last session of the last day. Uh, so I feel... Um, I'm just grateful that you all have stuck it out and that you're still here. Uh, today, we're going to talk about land use law update. And that's really exciting to me. Uh, maybe not to a lot of you all, but I think we have a lot of really fascinating cases this year. Uh, some crazy cases, really. I want to lead off with uh, I'm an I'm a professor of law at WVU College of Law, but I'm also part of really the only uh, land use clinic, um, maybe in the United States, definitely. There might be one other, uh, but uh, we have five attorneys and two AICP planners on the staff, and we look at land conservation and wastewater issues and more pertinent to you all, uh, we look at land use law. And as I was just talking to Mark, uh, we do education on land use law, but also uh, we do technical assistance for local governments in West Virginia, drafting comprehensive plans, zoning ordinances, subdivision regulations, and a whole slew of other um, uh, land use regulations. And we oftentimes partner with private consultants uh, on this process. And we also work with a lot of students, uh, which may be um, interesting uh, to some of you as well. Uh, but let's go on with the uh, cases. I'm gonna lead off with sign ordinances. There's an important case in the United States Supreme Court, talking about telecommunications, RELUPA, renewable energy, regulatory takings, 
And then we're going to talk about a new and emerging area of land use law, zoning and the Second Amendment. There have been several cases in this area, and I see this as a growing area. I've got one case on short-term rentals that I wanted to bring to your attention, and then just kind of a potpourri uh, of other miscellaneous cases. Okay, sign ordinances, everybody's favorite. So in city of Austin versus Reagan National Advertising, the issue in this case is that the city of Austin in their sign ordinance, as do I think about every sign ordinance in the United States, distinguishes between on-premises signs and off-premises signs. And one thing is that under uh, their ordinance, on-premises signs can be digitized while off-premises signs cannot. Uh, Reagan wants to digitize an off-premise sign. And so they challenged the ordinance uh, as an unconstitutional content-based regulation under Reed, under the Reed case. And basically the argument is, hey, I have to read the sign to determine whether it's off-premises or on-premises. Therefore, it's content-based. And they argued this case before the United States Supreme Court uh, just last week, uh, we expect a decision uh, in early 2022. In the oral arguments, a lot of the justices were very skeptical um, about the ordinance and, and pretty much said, can't you do an ordinance that doesn't require you to distinguish based on content? On the other hand, some of the justices were like, well, gosh, if we decide this against the city of Austin, then every local government in the United States is going to have to change their sign ordinance again. Um, another thing that came up, um, and the clinic has looked at this, uh, if the court decides in favor of Reagan, um, the Highway Beautification Act is also probably unconstitutional. Um, I don't know what's going to happen in this case, but here at the clinic, we have started to go to referring to signs as principal uses or accessory uses. And in our opinion, that gets around this content-based restriction. If the court decides in favor of Reagan, uh, we, along with everybody else, will be drafting some new uh, sign provisions to try to make sure that our ordinance complies. A couple other cases. There's a case out of Talbot County, Maryland, in the U.S. District Court. Um, and this is kind of a it's an interesting case uh, in a sense. Um, it's similar to the Reed case in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Number one, the county uh, prohibits campaign signs more than 60 days before the primary election. When that was challenged, the county fairly quickly said, well, we'll, we'll get rid of that for now. The, the county also has 10 different categories of temporary signs. Those categories are based on content uh, and they have different maximum square footages for each of the categories. Some of the categories have no maximum size at all. And the court said, facially, this is a content-based regulation. So it's subject to strict scrutiny and local governments almost always lose when it's strict scrutiny, and they lost here. Uh, Talbert County said, we are limiting these signs because of aesthetics. 
and traffic safety. And the court basically said, well, wait a minute. Why are signs that advertise for a political campaign any less aesthetically pleasing than a sign that does something else? And how is a political sign more dangerous with respect to traffic safety than, say, a sign that's advertising for an event? And so the court said that the ordinance is hopelessly under-inclusive, that you might have a 100-square-foot sign advertising for a church event, for example, that is going to distract drivers, and it's not going to be very pretty, and that's allowed, while these political campaign signs are not allowed. So the political candidate here was granted a preliminary injunction, which is pretty rare. That means they have a really good chance of prevailing in the court's opinion. And I think this case really stands for the proposition, yes, the read still applies, you can't have different categories of signs based on content. Uh, interesting case out of uh, Virginia, uh, Fourth Circuit case. So that would apply in Maryland as well. Um, so Virginia, the Virginia code forbids signs within the limits of any highway, but it has several exceptions. The exceptions that were at issue here, first are historical markers, warning signs, Red Cross emergency station signs, and things of that nature. And the court said, again, the court felt like this is pretty easy. This is government speech. And government speech is not really subject to the scrutiny that private speech is that limits on private speech are subject to. Uh, and so they said government speech, they can allow that. Um, and as one court said, citizens aren't allowed to be ventriloquists. The government can say almost anything they want to say. But the more problematic uh, exception was signs that contain advertisements or notices that have been authorized by the county and they are affixed to public transit passenger shelters. Um, and the court said these are content neutral. The, the statute doesn't say particular kind of signs can be on there while others cannot, doesn't limit content. So we're gonna look at this under intermediate scrutiny, under intermediate scrutiny, reasonable time, place, manner restrictions are allowed if they are sufficiently justified and narrowly enough drawn. In this case, the court said, allowing these types of signs was constitutionally okay. Um, the bad news for Fairfax County was that they asked the court to order the plaintiffs to pay their attorney's fees, and the court said, no, we're not going to do that. Next, on to a rather complicated uh, couple of rules on telecommunications. The first one um, is that uh, they amended one of their rules uh, that promotes the acceleration of uh, the deployment of 5G technology by facilitating co-location. And um, the, one of the rules says that state and local governments cannot deny certain requests to modify existing wireless structures that do not, quote, substantially change the physical dimensions of the structures. Prior to this rule, we didn't really have a lot of guidance on this. So what this rule says that 
as long as the excavating or deploying equipment is in an area no more than 30 feet beyond the existing boundaries of the telecommunications facility, that is not a substantial change. And that modification has to be allowed. Um, so local government should be aware that we kind of have boundaries here for substantial change. The next rule change was related to OTARD or over the air reception devices rule. This rule basically says that it preempts state and local government regulation of the siting of things like satellite dishes on private property. And the purpose is to allow all individuals to have access to satellite dishes and things like that and what comes with that. And um, in this ruling, the court invalidated a regulation by the city of Chicago that said that you cannot place your satellite antenna dish in any area that is visible from any street adjacent to the property. And the FCC felt like that ordinance overstepped the bounds of what the city could do. In addition, the city expanded the OTARD rule to include certain hub and relay antennas. Um, and these are antennas that serve multiple locations. So basically this means that if you have a trailer court or a condo or something like that, where you have a um, hub and relay antenna that provides uh, the satellite uh, signal to a number of different inhabitants. That's also subject to OTARD and local and state governments have very limited authority to limit the placement of those devices. Um, so those are the FCC rules on telecommunications. Okay, now, to some things that at least I think are pretty fun looking at RELUPA. And we have two cases on RELUPA that involve expansion of water and sewer hookup. And the cases are decided differently. And I think the rulings are very instructive in that they look at the comprehensive plan and the zoning ordinance and place a lot of stock in that. So in the Canaan Christian Church versus Montgomery County, Maryland, um, the church had contracted to buy some property uh, to put a large church on the property. And to do that, they needed to have the water and sewer category changed uh, so that they would be able to put the put the building on on this piece of property and the court looked at the comprehensive plan of, of montgomery county and they looked at the zoning ordinance and they said in this particular situation the church really didn't have a reasonable expectation that they could use this parcel for a church. And so the county's denial of the change request did not impose a substantial burden on religious exercise. In the previously adopted comprehensive plan, the county had said no public sewer shall be permitted for any use in this area. And the Department of Environment had already rejected water and sewer category change requests that are inconsistent with the local comprehensive plan. Um, granting this category change would be inconsistent 
with that statement. Um, and that's in the, and I'm sorry, I can't pronounce Patexit watershed, I'm sorry, rural edge neighborhood overlay, uh, but also the guidance with the water and sewer um, plan. Um, so the, the court basically said the local government has this covered in their comprehensive plan and their zoning. The local government, really, their hands were tied. They could not really extend water and sewer. Uh, the last thing the court said was that the church had tried to use a museum as an exemplar. And the court said that's really not a good exemplar uh, compared to her in this case. Now, in Redeemed Christian Church of God of Bowie, Maryland versus Prince George's County, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals came to a different result in this case. Similar facts, though, the church uh, had asked for an amendment to the water and sewer plan um, so that they could have water and sewer to build a church. And the court went through and they said, first of all, county did individualized assessments of the uses of the property and they did that properly. Um, the county had said, well, these water and sewer plans, they're not zoning under Maryland law, so they're not covered by RLUPA. And this is a ruling that I have anticipated. There have been a couple of others like this across the country. The court said under RLUPA, we don't look at the state definition of zoning. We don't look at the local definition of zoning. We look at the federal definition of zoning. And if it kind of quacks like a zoning ordinance or a land use regulation and waddles like a land use regulation, it's covered under RLUIPA. And so the court said uh, this amendment to the water and sewer plan is covered by RLUIPA. And it poses us, and the fact that the county denied it, that imposes a substantial burden on Victory Temple's religious practice. So, unlike the last case, we are going to apply strict scrutiny. Local governments usually lose when strict scrutiny is applied, and they lost here. The county had said that traffic safety was their compelling interest in denying the water and sewer um, extension. This ruling is fascinating for me because it seems like the Fourth Circuit is dabbling in land use planning, which federal courts don't do very often. The court said that the county didn't show that the denial of the application was the least restrictive means of furthering their interest in traffic safety. First of all, the county said, well, wait a minute. We have two choices. We can either accept, approve the application, deny the application. The court said, not really. You have more choices than that. The court said you should have approved the application uh, for the extension of water and sewer. Then you go to the next step, which is subdivision. And according to the court, the county could at that step in the process impose least, a least restrictive means of furthering the interest in traffic safety. And the court even suggested, they said, hey, you could say that you have to do roadway improvements uh, or additional road signs. 
It's a very interesting case in that the court really did a deep dive into local government land use regulation and said, you're at the wrong step here. Approve the extension of water and sewer, then deal with traffic safety in your subdivision approval. Okay, on to renewable energy. I hope everybody has their seatbelt fastened. Uh, we're moving through this at a rapid rate. Um, renewable energy, Frederick County, Maryland versus Lagore Bridge Solar Center. Um, in this case, the Maryland Public Service Commission approved a certificate of public convenience and necessity for a solar energy generating system uh, in Frederick County, Maryland. Frederick County uh, challenged this. And I, I found this case interesting because it talks about a lot of recent changes in Maryland law. The court said while Lagore was uh, seeking to build this solar facility, and it's on land zoned for agricultural uses, three things happened that really impact this case. The first thing that happened was that Frederick County responded to a large number of private proposals to put solar facilities on ag land. That is a big concern in a lot of communities that a lot of solar facilities are uh, being placed on ag land and so the farmland preservation and promotion of renewable energy are kind of clashing here. And so Frederick County passed the local regulation that addressed that. The second thing that happened was that the General Assembly responded to some concerns of local governments um, and passed a law that said that the PSC must give due consideration to the consistency of the application with the comprehensive plan and the county. Um, and the third thing that happened was that we had some court decisions. Um, and the court decisions said that the uh, PSC regulatory authority preempted the local zoning. Um, so the question that the court considered was, did the PSC give due consideration um, to the county comprehensive plan and the zoning ordinance? This is one of two cases that we're going to talk about today that involve vested rights. And in this case, the PSC kind of derailed the whole process. And they said, well, wait a minute. Lagore has a vested right in the special exception that was granted by the county prior to changing the zoning ordinance. So we don't need to look at everything else because he has a vested right. So they're entitled to build it. The court said, eh, you got the law of vested rights wrong. Lagore must have undertaken a substantial beginning in construction before the change in zoning occurs to vest the right. Lagore didn't do that. And in the court's words, the whole PSC proceeding was infected with the error of treating this special exception as a vested right. And so the court said, we're going to send it back to the PSC. You have to conduct a due consideration analysis of the county's comprehensive plan and their zoning ordinance. So that is a good case that will preview what the courts are gonna require of the PSC 
now that the law has been changed. The Wing case that will never go away, uh, there was another decision on the Dan's Mountain case in 2021. This is in Allegheny County, Maryland, um, in the Maryland Court of Special Appeals. And you might recall that in this case, um, Allegheny County had reviewed some variances and special exceptions for Dan's Mountain. It had been appealed through the court system. Uh, the court system sent it back to the local government, to the Board of Zoning Appeals with instructions. And um, the board had initially denied the variance and special exception. Um, this time, they wrote a very detailed and thorough opinion that granted the separation and setback variances and the special exception. And a citizen a group appealed it to the courts again. I've never seen a court say this before. The court here said, we look back at our opinion. We told the board to conduct an appropriate analysis on each property, each factor, and each application. And they said, you know what? We really weren't clear enough, and maybe we told them to do too much because they didn't have to look at all those issues with respect to every parcel. They only needed to do it with respect to the parcels for which a variance was requested. So the court said, our bad, we, we made a mistake. We told them to do too much. No harm, no foul though. Uh, the county went in, they did exactly what we told them to do, but their analysis on these parcels where the variance wasn't required that's legally irrelevant. It's surplusage. We're not going to worry about that. And also the fact that the county uh, organized their decision around the names of the adjacent parcels instead of the properties upon which the turbines would be placed is also legally irrelevant. Um, and they basically said, good job, Board of, of Zoning Appeals. We're sorry that we told you to do too much, but you did what you needed to do. You did it well, and we affirm your decision. Okay, let me take a deep breath here. I'm going to go to regulatory takings. A very significant regulatory takings case was decided by the United States Supreme Court earlier this year. It was in California. And in this case, the California uh, legislature had passed a law that gave unions in California the right to um, come on the property of businesses in the state at certain times um, in order to basically solicit union membership. So the union had come on the property of a strawberry farm, Cedar Point Nursery, and Cedar Point Nursery didn't want them on the property. They said, hey, we have the right to be here. Uh, and they talked to the employees. Actually, there were some protests uh, they organized some protests on the business premises. Um, the uh, Cedar Point Nurseries filed a lawsuit and said, under the regulatory takings test that we're going to talk about more in a couple minutes, if the law forces us to tolerate a physical invasion, it's a regulatory taking. It's what we call a categorical taking, automatically a taking. Um, 
basically the defendant said, well, wait a minute. It has to be permanent physical invasion and allowing this union to come on the property for just intermittent time periods, that's not enough. Well, the United States Supreme Court in a six to three decision said essentially what the state legislature has done is granted an easement across the business's property to these union groups, allowing them to act, access the property. And there were arguments that said, well, this doesn't exactly fit the state definition of, the, of an easement. And the court said, doesn't matter if it fits it exactly, it's an easement. Um, and it's a, it's a taking. This could be a very a significant case. I think at first blush, a lot of people say, well, big deal. Um, but what I'm hearing local governments worry about, and I think it's, it, I think it's valid for them to worry about, is any time that they have a local government official that's allowed to come onto somebody's property. Now, the court mentioned that, but they weren't really clear about it. So I think local governments have to be careful. Uh, there have already been some lawsuits filed um, on COVID restrictions, saying that prohibiting people from coming to my business uh, because of COVID is um, what we call a negative uh, servitude which is also a physical invasion. I think right to farm cases have been analyzed as an easement across the neighbor's property. So we could have some right to farm cases. I think this is a case where the United States may have uh, taken the lid off of the bottle and the genie came out and we might see them trying to put the lid back on the bottle. Um, but be careful about this uh, when you're thinking about your regulations. Uh, Clayland Farms, this is a repeat from last year as well. It went up to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals who affirmed it. Um, Clayland Farms had 106 acres in Talbot County. Um, they wanted to put in a development. They were approved for a six lot development. They wanted a lot more. Um, and the county put a moratorium on new subdivisions uh, so that they could uh, develop their comprehensive sewer plan and make it consistent with their land use plan, their comprehensive plan. Um, and then they rezoned it uh, from village center to resource conservation, which reduced the value of the property and reduced the development of potential. Clayland said, that's a taking and you need to compensate me. So in this case, not a physical invasion. So the court said, we're gonna look at the Penn Central balancing test. The first factor on the Penn Central balancing test is the economic impact of the regulation on the landowner. It reduced the value of the land by 40%. And the court said, well, recently we held that in Pulte, that an 83% reduction was insufficient. And Clayland, you can still build houses. So, that factor militates against a regulatory taking. Secondly, we look at the landowner's reasonable investment backed expectations. And the court said, your expectations weren't really reasonable. You can't assume that the zoning is not going to change. And you're not allowed or you're not entitled to do whatever you want with your property. Um, 
you you are just entitled to have some economic use of the property. The third factor, however, the court said weighed in favor of Claylam Farms. The court was really not excited about the moratorium. Um, they didn't like the fact that it was six years long. And they didn't like the fact that the county said it was needed to delay, to, they needed the delay to develop their comprehensive plan. So they said that factor weighed in favor of a taking. However, looking at the three factors in Toto, the court said no regulatory takings here. Okay, now, this is what I think is the next hot thing in land use law. There have been several cases, most in Pennsylvania, but one in Illinois and one in Virginia, where landowners or gun owners have challenged zoning provisions or in Virginia, it was a COVID restriction. And the courts are now starting to develop a body of case law on what does the Second Amendment mean for your zoning ordinance? This is one that I think you all need to watch out for. I think we're going to see a lot more of these cases. The first one was in the Third Circuit Court of Appeals and involved Robinson Township in uh, Pennsylvania. And in this case, a gun organization, a gun club, and the operator of the gun club filed a lawsuit against the township under 42 USC section 1983. And that's basically a vehicle for a constitutional claim. And they said township and the township zoning officer violated their second amendment rights by number one, stalling uh, their zoning application. And number two, basically trying to zone the gun club out of existence. And so the court said, wow, this is new. This is the first time a court has looked at this, but we're not going to apply strict scrutiny. We're going to apply interme intermediate scrutiny. But, and this, every court has applied intermediate scrutiny, but the local government has lost every time. Um, in this case, the court said Robinson Township failed to establish a close fit between the challenge rules and the actual benefits they served. In other words, I think what the court's doing here is it's kind of like the sexually oriented business, which is First Amendment, kind of like your sign ordinance, which is First Amendment. The court is telling local governments, it's not enough for you to say guns are bad. You need to put some evidence. You need to have a, a statement in your zoning ordinance that specifically identifies what the issues are and how the particular ordinance that you passed is going to address that issue. And in this case, the court said Robinson Township didn't do enough, even under intermediate scrutiny. Um, so they ruled in favor of the uh, gun rights organization and the gun club owner. Um, in this, in the next case, it's also in Pennsylvania, but it's in the state court. Um, and the lower court said that Stroud Township did not violate the appellant's um, Second Amendment right. But on appeal, uh, the court reversed that. 
and said that the ordinance that we had here, um, and, and the ordinance here said no shooting ranges at your house. You can't have a personal shooting range at your residence. And the court said the Second Amendment includes the right to remain to re maintain your proficiency in firearm use. And an outright ban on target shooting everywhere in the township, but in two specific zoning or districts, um, was not that was not a good fit. And um, the court said that the township did not show that they had burdened the um, conduct the least amount possible to achieve the uh, goals of the ordinance. So again, local governments are gonna have to say, here's the problem or here's the issue. Here's what we're going to do about it. It imposes the least amount of burden that we can on the Second Amendment right, and it achieves our goal. And the court here said you didn't do that. The third case where the local government um, uh, failed to, to prevail was in Illinois. And in that case, the Illinois local government said that if you're in a forest preserve zoning district, even if you have a concealed weapon permit, you cannot carry that concealed weapon. And the court, again, this is similar to the other two cases. They said that's too broad. I mean, can't you narrow it, does it have to be an outright ban? Can't you do something narrower and less burdensome on the Second Amendment right uh, to achieve the goal that you want to achieve? So again, you're going to have to be really, really careful uh, in drafting these ordinances. The only firearm regulation that withstood challenge was in Virginia. It was an executive order shutting down public access to shooting ranges due to COVID. And even in that case, the Virginia court said, yes, the Second Amendment um, extends to the right to train, to use firearms, but not to a private shooting range. That was a circuit court, it was a COVID decision, so even though the state prevailed in this, um, I would still be careful about regulating uh, gun activities from here on in. Shifting to short-term rentals, I hope you don't have any guns at your short-term rentals, uh, but in this case, um, and, I, and I included this case because it's from Virginia, but it also um, is a theme that courts around the country are grabbing onto. And that is um, the Fairfax County ordinance defined dwelling um, as a building designed for residential occupancy. Then they said certain things like a hotel and a rooming house are not um, are not a dwelling. They do not occur in a dwelling. And then the county amended the definition to allow short-term rentals. The court held that the county, and this was the Virginia Supreme Court, that that original definition of short-term rental, I'm sorry, of dwelling, that initial definition of dwelling does not include short-term rentals. And part of it is that second part of the definition, but courts all over the United States are starting to look at words like residence and dwelling and saying residence implies a permanent type 
of of inhabitants by by the people in the in the structure. And I'm going to do a short term rental webinar tomorrow. Courts are also saying family doesn't mean a family related by blood that's only staying there for a week or two. Family means somebody that's staying there on a semi-permanent basis. The other thing that this court said was that the Virginia Code allows the local government to impose a transient occupancy tax on residential properties that are being used as short-term rentals. For the next little bit of time that we have tonight, I'm going to talk about a potpourri of uh, cases that involve land use. And I think if I can give you the principles from these cases ahead of time, principle number one, and you're going to see that in this case, when you are drafting your zoning ordinance or your subdivision ordinance or any land use ordinance, be really careful about the wording that you use because the court is going to read that and they're going to say they must have meant what they said. Um, and sometimes it's easy to have an ordinance where the language you think is clear, but maybe not. Um, the second thing that I think these cases show is that planning commissions and boards of zoning appeals, when they are making decisions, they better have really good findings of fact and conclusions of law. Because if you don't, the court's going to send it back. And in West Virginia, if you don't have adequate findings of fact and conclusions of law, the court will order the local government to pay the attorney's fees of the applicant. So be really careful with your BZA and your planning commission. Excuse me, this case, in reading the case, I think the court itself was kind of a surprise. But we had a gentleman here who liked to have storage buildings on his property. He had seven of them. And the storage buildings totaled 1,870 square feet. His house was only 1,176 square feet. So Montgomery County, Maryland said, hey, whoa, dude. Uh, accessory means that it's smaller. And now your, your outbuildings are bigger than your house. And we actually have an ordinance on this. And the ordinance said the maximum footprint for an accessory building if, is 50% of the main building or 600 square feet, whichever is greater. The court said, the ordinance is singular. The ordinance doesn't say all of the accessory buildings have to total that amount or less. They're saying that an individual accessory building can be no larger than that. So in this case, uh, Mr. Cruz can keep all seven of his accessory buildings and he can build more if he wants, as long as each individual building is less than the total that's allowed. Another case out of Maryland, uh, this is in Frederick County. And in Frederick County, uh, the vote was two to two on a motion to deny a site plan. Uh, a tie vote says that the site plan is denied. Uh, the circuit court reversed it and remanded it to the uh, Board of Appeals for more fact-finding. The first question is, is the standard of review for the court in a um, tie vote different 
then the standard of review, um, with, if it was a three to two vote or, a, or something of that matter, a uh, majority vote. Um, and the court said same, same standard of review, substantial evidence. But here the court said uh, that the board of the board of appeals did not give an adequate explanation for their decision. Since they didn't give it adequate findings of fact and conclusions of law, we can't reverse it because we don't know what enough of the facts because the board of appeals didn't didn't uh, do enough fact finding. So instead of reversing it, we're just going to vacate it and send it back. And this time, do adequate findings of fact and conclusions of law. The next case um, is, is, again, kind of a language case, but an interesting case. Uh, Greco applied uh, to put in a commercial dog kennel. Um, Anne Arundel County Board of Appeals granted the application. Um, Greco wants to put in a dog training facility. There was an appeal. Uh, the Board of Appeals uh, had nine hearings, nine, nine hearings on this issue. And they said, okay, um, we're going to let you do training uh, and we're going to let you do boarding as an accessory use but you need to install sound attenuating materials uh, and you are limited to 20 dogs. Everybody appeals. Um, and the circuit court said, well, and the circuit court kind of took it on themselves and said, the definition of dog kennel doesn't include uh, training, uh, but that issue was never brought up before the Board of Appeals. And that was the basis that the circuit court reversed it. So on appeal, um, the court said that the application was properly approved by the Board of, of Appeals and that the limit on 20 dogs is appropriate. They said the issue about training in the definition was not brought up uh, timely. So we're not going to look at that. And the court commented, that the Board of Appeals had detailed findings of fact and conclusions of law. So they deferred to that uh, finding. We're running out of time, I know. I'm going to do a couple more here. Um, Hudson versus Mayor Baltimore. I think this is interesting. Might only apply to Baltimore, though. This is where Baltimore adopted a new zoning ordinance called Transform Baltimore. And um, in the new zoning ordinance, they said, if you file your application before June 5th, 2017, it's vested under the old rule. Um, but in this case, the city council failed to make uh, findings of fact or conclusions of law. And the court looked, and this is where you got to be careful with your language, because the court said in reading the old zoning ordinance and reading the new zoning ordinance, number one, it's not a vested right. And number two, what they need to do is accept the application under the old zoning ordinance. But the new zoning ordinance says that you have to compare what they can do of right under the new zoning ordinance compared uh, to what the application is for what they want to do. So really interesting dynamic between the old ordinance and the, and the new ordinance. Um, there are a couple crazy cases that I do want to make sure that I touch on uh, before we stop here tonight. Um, 
the Johnson versus Mayor of Baltimore, two points here. Number one, the uh, complaining parties here wanted uh, the city council to make findings of fact on everything under the sun. And the court said, you don't have to do everything. You can focus on the main points that apply here. The second thing is, and I think this makes sense, but it was still in court. The language in the ordinance said permitted uses are in this particular district are all uses listed as permitted and not solely as special exceptions or conditional uses in all zoning districts. The complaining party said what that means, let's read it literally, is the only thing you can do in this zoning district is a use that is allowed in every other zoning district. Gaithersburg said, no, 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 that's not what we mean. We mean that you can do anything in this zoning district that is allowed of right in any one zoning district in the city. The court agreed with the city of, uh, of Gaithersburg in this case. The other significant issue is that the opponents wanted to cross-examine some witnesses, but they didn't complain about that till they got to court. Court said too late. Okay, now here's a crazy case. And here's a case that I want all of y'all to, to pay attention to because in this case, the zoning administrator, the planning director, and the floodplain manager, along with the county, were sued under the Fourth Amendment and under an equal protection claim. And this is in federal court. And this is in Warren County, Virginia, near where I grew up in Frederick County, Virginia. Basically, what's alleged here by the landowner is that the county, and he, he did say it was a conspiracy, but the court said there's no evidence of a conspiracy. But he said that the county singled me out to pick on me about alleged violations to the floodplain rules. And the floodplain manager actually trespassed on his property to see um, this item that they said was uh, violated the ordinance. And the court said, now the court kicked the county out, but the court said, as to the um, floodplain manager, the zoning administrator and the uh, planning director, you all, are kept in the case for this equal protection claim. It looks like you singled out this guy to pick on him and try to uh, make him pay for a violation that a lot of other people had. To allow the case to proceed, and they allowed the punitive damages part to proceed too, is really extraordinary. And for the floodplain manager who actually trespassed onto the property, the court said, you couldn't do that under the Virginia Erosion and Settlement, Settlement Control Program. So we're gonna keep the Fourth Amendment claim against you in, that is scary. And I think I'm going to do one more case. Yeah, I'll do this case and then I'll stop because this is a similar case and it's in Virginia too. So I'm wondering what's happening in Virginia. And this is in the Supreme Court of Virginia. It's in Matthews County, Southern Virginia. So Eubanks received a violation and correction order from the county. The county said you expanded your non-conforming structure by four feet. 
Eubank said, we haven't done anything to this house in 50 years. And he got a letter from a surveyor saying that, that the footprint of the house hasn't changed for 40 years, 50 years, I'm sorry. And the county says this happened recently. So the county filed criminal charges against Eubanks. And Eubanks prevailed on the criminal charges. And then he turned around and filed a malicious prosecution claim against the county and an abusive process claim against the county. And what Eubanks said was, this house is on the river. What the county was trying to do was make me tear down the house so that they could obtain the property through eminent domain and have better public access to the river and not have to pay me much money. Again, this should scare people. The court said, you have stated a claim for malicious prosecution. Now the court said, you don't show where the county abused the process but you make a claim for malicious prosecution and this case can go on to the jury. So we've got a couple cases here in Virginia where we've got uh, local governments, planning directors, zoning administrators that are being raked through the coals in court. So it's something uh, that you all should watch out for. So I'm going to stop there and see if Mark or anybody else has any questions for me. Thank you very much, Jesse. Um, there was a lot to unpack there. And thank you um, again for all of your insight and everything. Uh, there were a couple of questions that came in and I wanted to uh, touch on one of the first, I, I guess the the question I wanted to touch on one of the first um, cases you brought up about the circuit courts dabbling in land use law or land use planning. And the question um, asks, hasn't the Supreme Court dabbled in land use planning with the Kelo decisions and the Tahoe decisions? So isn't there precedence for, at least at the Supreme Court saying, planning or planning is an adequate is something is part is a police power that is adequate for the local jurisdiction to um endeavor into yeah that's a good that's a good point <clears throat> and i think in the kilo case and, and i agree they have dabbled in land use planning i think the important thing in the kilo case was that um the court I forget how many times it mentioned planning and plan, but it was a lot. And so the court really relied on the fact that that New London didn't just, you know, on a whim say we're going to do this, that they engaged in a in a very considerate, considerable planning process. Um, and so they really deferred to that planning process. Um, and said, you've planned it out, it's a public purpose, we're going to defer to that. Uh, so very, very good point. And on Tahoe, that involved a moratorium, um, and the court again um, said that that was not a taking, and so deferred to the, to the government agency in that case as well. What struck me on this um, uh, redeemed um, is it the redeemed church but what the relupa case was that not only did they dabble in land use planning but they kind of looked beyond what was before the court and they said well I, I read your subdivision ordinance apparently and if I were were the county and I was looking at this I would approve the application and then deal with it in the subdivision uh, ordinance application. 
to me, that shows that the court was paying attention and, and they were really thinking about it. Um, now, I think some people might say the court may have overstepped their bounds in that. I, I don't know, uh, but it, it's interesting either way. So good, good point, good question. You're muted, Mark. Sorry. Um, the second question, I think is referring to the Cedar Point Farm um, from your uh, one of your earlier cases in California. And it asked the question, and I don't know if this is exactly what you said, but um, you can tell us. The question is, if the court found that it was that the state was effectively creating an easement across private property, could that be interpreted as the the state was providing a temporary easement across all commercial properties uh, across the state? Yeah, and I think I think the court did interpret that as an easement across all commercial properties in the state. But one of the arguments in the case was, this is a temporary easement according to the state. Um, and the court rejected that. They said, no, this isn't a temporary easement. This is a permanent easement. And the court specifically addressed the issue. They said, we're not going to require that somebody invade your property 24-7, 365. An easement in and of itself is a physical invasion because it is permission by the state for people to come onto your property. So the court rejected the argument of California that it was just temporary and that it shouldn't be a taking. And instead they say, this is really like, let, let me give you an analogy. And this is the analogy that the court would use. The court said, this is just like your neighbor Give, getting an easement of ingress and egress over your property. And they can drive over your property to get into their parcel or out of their parcel. The court said the fact that they're not doing that 24 seven, that they're not always driving back and forth on your property, that's irrelevant. The fact is that the easement is there permanently allowing them to do it. So this is a big case. It's a really important case. Oh, okay. That's, that's very uh, good to know. Um, the, this question just came in. Um, for regulating those green infrastructure, such as, a, as windmill, solar array, what are the general legal advices you can give to planners? Well, given, at least in Maryland, what I would say, and I think uh, this is probably true um, in Virginia and D.C. as well, but in Maryland, where the, the state legislature has specifically said that uh, the PSC um, is basically in charge, but they have to give due consideration to your um, comprehensive plan and zoning regulations, my advice would be that in your comprehensive plan and in your zoning ordinance, you very clearly lay out where you want these types of facilities and where you don't want these types of facilities and why. And I think if I were a local government or advising a local government, I would say, don't put in your comprehensive plan. We don't want solar at all. We don't want windmills at all. 
um, put be thoughtful about it and say, we have to accept these somewhere. So where do we want them? And maybe even more importantly, where do we want to make sure that they don't locate? And one issue that came out in the in the Lagore case, and we're seeing this all over the country, is a lot of state and local governments are really concerned that wind turbines and solar facilities are going on to ag land. And so a lot of state and local governments are starting to pass regulations on that. And so that would be my advice is that you prioritize where, if you have to take these, where are you gonna put them? And if there are lands that you absolutely don't want these facilities to be on, identify that and lay out your rationale for that. Um, because in Maryland, uh, this, the PSC has to give due deference to that, due consideration. In Virginia and DC, I think you might have a lot more authority than that. Uh, so I think basically do good land use planning and really think about it and don't ban things uh, just lay out where you would absolutely not want them and where you will tolerate them. Thank you. And I think we have a couple question, uh, couple minutes left. Um, so this one question that came in that seems a little broad, but um, answer it however you think best. So the question asks, what are the and you touched on this earlier, uh, some of the cases at the uh, district level. What are the cases that you think over the next three to five years will be coming up to the Supreme Court and that may have a positive or negative effect on land use planning as we've been doing it? I was, I'm thinking specifically about the Second Amendment cases you mentioned. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And if I had to guess, I would say yes. I, I think we might see a Second Amendment zoning case in the United States Supreme Court. I would not be surprised if we see another sign ordinance case in the United States Supreme Court. Sign ordinances seem to be it's just a problem that never goes away. And the other issue that may very well come before the United States Supreme Court is a regulatory takings case that is more directly related to land use planning uh, than um, the Cedar nursery case. I mean, I think that has some connections to land use planning, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if we see cases that are right, right in the land use planning wheelhouse. And the other, and the other hot issue that I see are short term rentals, and I know the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals decided a case on that about a year or two ago. That was not appealed to the United States Supreme Court, but given the fact that it's such a hot issue and given the fact that I think Airbnb and some of these other platforms are kind of pushing back on some of the local regulation, I wouldn't be surprised if that comes up as well. You're muted again. Yeah. So I think we have time for one last question. Um, and this is kind of broad, n broader than just land use planning, but I think it's uh, uh, an important question to ask just based on what you said earlier. Since the Supreme Court is um, 
has been said is very conservative and very business friendly. Do you anticipate the Supreme Court, um, again, using your crystal ball over the next couple of years, siding more with individuals against local municipalities uh, with respect to, as you said, uh, temporary rentals, uh, Second Amendment, and other items where maybe some of the previous decisions that have supported land use planning and planning as a profession might be overturned? Wow, that's another great question. I think I can get some students to write papers on some <laughs> of these questions, but uh, that to me is a mixed bag a little bit because I think definitely this court is definitely going to lean more toward private property rights. So I think land use regulation is going to be under more of a microscope because anything that infringes on private property rights, um, I think the court is going to really scrutinize that. But I think the business versus local government or, or, or state government the conservatives are also, for lack of a better term, law and order. Uh, so they also seem to support um, governmental controls, at least in some areas. Uh, but that's going to be balanced against the business interest. If a short-term rental case comes up, I see that as being more of a private property rights issue than a business issue. And I think that slant toward private property rights might mean that, that local and state governments might be on the losing side of that. But I think it's going to be a close call. Second Amendment, this court, even before the the addition of Amy Coney Barrett, Justice Barrett, has shown a real proclivity towards protecting and I don't want to say expanding, but they protect and maybe I should say interpreting Second Amendment rights very broadly. So on the Second Amendment issue, I see the court coming down on the side of the Second Amendment. And, and that's why I think local governments need to be really careful. I'm not saying don't regulate guns or shoot, shooting ranges. I'm just saying that when you do that ordinance, treat it like an SOB ordinance, treat it like a sign ordinance and have your purpose statement that very, very clearly sets out, here's why we're regulating guns and shooting ranges. We don't want to infringe on the Second Amendment. Here's why we're doing it. This is the least intrusive way we can do it, and here's why. So just try to justify your ordinance with, with as much evidence as you can. Uh, with that, Jesse, um, again, thank you very much for your time. Um, I appreciate it. And I know the um, 45 or so uh, attendees that we have have uh, definitely appreciated that. So with that, um, I wanted to personally thank everyone for attending the conference this year. Uh, I hope it was informative. As I mentioned, we'll have some more information coming in the next couple of weeks about um, some events for next year. And if anybody is short of their CM credits for the year, please let me know. We'll be sending out more information on how to obtain the remaining uh, CM credits you might need. Uh, by attending this, obviously you get your law done. And with that, um, I'm going to end this session. Uh, Jesse, again, thank you. Everyone have a great rest of your week. Please stay safe and sane, and we'll see you all soon. Bye now. Thanks, everybody.
Have a wonderful holiday. Thank you, Jesse.